I don't consider myself a scientist whatsoever. I'm only a freshman in high school, but <laughs> I, I, um, you know, I just started looking around for things that um, might help me, you know, have an argument against evolution since biology is part of my class list this year. And um, I came along a, a bunch of things, mostly um, uh, a scientist whose name is uh, you know, left me right now, but who has a website, uh, drdino.com, who I, you might know. And um, he has some things on his website, like um, he has pictures of trees growing through uh, different layers of geometric rock that, you know, is supposedly gone over millions of years, um, growing straight up, going through those layers. Um, things like Job uh, 4015. Um, that seems to describe like a dinosaur um, living with humans and things like that. And uh, gosh, there's one other thing. But um, and I was just wondering how you could explain those things. Um, oh, the other thing was um, how dating the, the lives and uh, like the number of years that humans lived from Adam and Eve to now that it goes back to six, about 6,000 years ago. And uh, I was just wondering how you might explain those. Okay. Uh, if you want a longer answer, uh, I actually debated Dr. Dino on national television uh, for two hours and 40 minutes, and uh, this is the product. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, we discuss those issues and a lot of other issues as well. And uh, we make available the uncut uh, version uh, of the debate. So, um, but uh, let me see, there are three points that you made. Oh yeah, the, the date uh, for humanity. Um, what you'll see in, in fact, we're bringing out a book on human origins in October, and uh, I think this is also up on our website. Uh, we show a calibration of the Genesis 11 genealogies that allows you to come up with a biblical date uh, for the origin of humanity. And uh, how it works is that uh, you've got uh, Abraham, the last man in the genealogy. And we have an accurate historical date based on the biblical record as well as extra biblical historical sources that place him as living about 4,000 years ago. Then halfway in the genealogy from Noah to Abraham, you've got a man called Peleg. And Genesis 10 tells us that the world was divided in the days of Peleg. And we believe that's a reference to the breaking of the Bering Land Bridge. There was a nice wide bridge that was connecting Siberia to Alaska that permitted humans to migrate, uh, but that bridge was broken, and uh, we have accurate carbon-14 dating that tells us that happened 11,000 years ago. So if Peleg was alive 11,000 years ago, and if Abraham was alive 4,000 years ago, and if the lifespans recorded in Genesis 11 are approximately proportional to the passage of time, that would put the flood of Noah in a neighborhood of, say, 25 to 35,000 years ago, and Adam and Eve in the neighborhood of uh, 50,000 years ago. And uh, Fuzz Rana will talk to you tomorrow about how we now have new scientific dating tools using genetics, mitochondrial DNA, and a Y chromosome analysis, as well as new archaeological finds that establish that the, the scientific date for the origin of humanity is about 50,000 years ago. So we really have a consistent uh, picture here. Uh, let's see, the second point was about uh, dinosaurs. And humans living together. And humans living together. Uh, I deal with this in this book, A Matter of Days, uh, about the claims that there are footprints in a Texas riverbed uh, that shows human footprints uh, crossing dinosaur footprints. And most young earth creationists, Dr. Dino is a young earth creationist, uh, it's Kent Hoven. His nickname is Dr. Dino. Um, most young earth creationist leaders have withdrawn the claim uh, that this is evidence for humans and dinosaurs living together. I think Dr. Dino is one of the few holdouts that really claims it is evidence. And the reason why most of them have withdrawn the claim is because if you look carefully at the so-called human footprints, the gait is a little, about a foot longer than a human stride and it's about the right length for a dinosaur stride. And also you can take a brush and you can artificially, well you can actually erode some of the soft 
uh, dirt that's around the print. And the principle here is that if you're walking through mud and you pull your foot out of uh, fairly thick mud, you get this sucking sound and what happens is soft mud will go in to fill in your print and so the print left behind is smaller than your original foot. And so scientists have actually eroded away that softer material and they recover the original print. And it's a dinosaur print, not a human print. The other thing you notice is there's a claw mark behind the heel. As far as I know, there's never been a human being with a claw behind the heel. And probably the most compelling evidence, there's a chemical residue. And if you analyze a chemical residue, it identifies the species that left the print. And in this case, it's a three-toed um, carnivorous uh, dinosaur. So uh, I take the position uh, that dinosaurs did not cohabit with human beings. I also take the position that Job 40 is not addressing uh, dinosaurs. The behemoth and the leviathan, in my opinion, are not dinosaurs. Most likely, I think they're the hippopotamus and they're the crocodile. And yeah, they are described in terrifying language. Uh, but what Job is doing for us is describing the emotional e effect of a man coming into close contact with this leviathan creature or this behemoth creature when you're armed with a sing single stick or a rock in your hand. And, they, and it's loaded with metaphorical language. Just count how many times Job 40 and 41 uses the words as and like. In one translation I counted 21 times. So it's not telling us that this is a creature that's got plates of steel in its belly. It says it may as well have plates of steel in its belly for all the good your stick is going to do. And it may as well be breathing fire out of its mouth for all the good the rock is going to do in your hand. And I've been to Africa three times uh, speaking and teaching there and I ran into a biologist there that said there's two creatures in Africa that are responsible for about 95% of all human deaths. It's the hippo and the crocodile. Job 40 tells us that the hippo is a vegetarian, but extremely territorial and very hard to see in the water. It lies there submerged in muddy water with only two nostrils above the surface. So if you're in a canoe going down the river, you will not spot the hippos until it's too late. The hippos won't eat you, but they will capsize your canoe and the crocodiles know that's going to happen, so they just sit there waiting for lunch. <laughs> and there was a third point, yes. I can't remember the third one. The trees coming down through the... The trees? Oh, yeah. The one about uh, the fact that he, uh, Kent Hoban argues we must be living on a young earth because when you go to the Cran Canyon and other places like that, you see all these sedimentary layers, but jutting through them, uh, are these fossilized trees. And uh, what he tries to do is to paint the old earth, young earth debate as a debate between geologists who believe that it's uniformitarian process, where you have the layers laid down by gradual erosion type mechanisms. And then you have the young earth creationists who argue it's catastrophism. There is these, well, there's just this one dramatic catastrophe, the global flood, that makes things happen very rapidly. That's really a, a misnomer of what's going on in geology. The tru truth is, geologists believe in both uniformitarian uh, processes and catastrophic processes. And it's not just one flood, it's hundreds of floods, hundreds of disasters, like these asteroid collisions. And when these disasters hit, what it does is it causes things like trees to be blasted through several sedimentary layers. Uh, you know, you guys live in uh, tornado country. Now, if you get a real good tornado coming through an Illinois cornfield, what that tornado can do is uh, cause a corn stalk to be blown up from the ground, and it can drive it through a tree that's 50 years old, such that the corn stalk is not damaged at all. It actually goes right through the tree. We see that routinely with tornadoes. Well, that's a good example of what I'm talking about. The growth of the tree is gradual, year by year it forms a ring, and then the tornado uh, puts this uh, corn stalk right through a hundred uh, layers uh, of the tree. We see the same thing in the Grand Canyon. And when you look at all the evidence, it's evidence for an old earth, uh, not a young earth. But hey, if you want to look at the bait, it's here. And if you want to look at something that's much more scholarly, this is a written debate 
uh, where three positions are presented, the framework hypothesis, uh, the day-age position that I defend, and uh, then the 24-hour position. So don't take my word for it. Uh, read the debate books, look at the debate video, and make up your own mind.